Good morning, you guys. It's your boy Ben Mahari here, representing Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. Much love to the entire LDBC and the entire uh, basketball community. If you want more basketball content, tune into Basketball Conversations every Friday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. This is where we discuss basketball related topics, news, debates, and everything else in the world of basketball. All right. So, this is once again another episode of Morning Historical Perspective. Now that we're at 1,000 subscribers, I will regularly post in a, uh, a a, a poll on my community post and I'm going to get let you guys decide on four different subjects that you want me to cover on and then every Monday, Wednesday and Friday I will give you guys a video and I will give you guys my breakdown on certain players, teams, series, whatever you guys want me to talk about. So, for this one right here, uh, this is basically it was uh, this is basically a uh, community post request. So for this portion here we're going to talk about one of the greatest you know championship teams in ncaa tournament history and that is the 1989-1990 unlv running rebels perhaps one of the greatest teams you know one of the greatest uh non-power conference championship teams of all time all right and this is a team that was pretty much a loaded team from top to bottom i mean if you want to talk about a team that was just dominant at pretty much at every single position and pretty much basically rump teams out of the building if this is this is a team that did everything else and besides some all right but um i'll tell you this though with about this team the reason why this team you know carries a special place in many people's hearts is because this was a team that represented a lot of the anti-establishment in america you know what i'm saying they were pretty much the anti-establishment to what people is perceived to be as like you know, the new generation versus the old generation. You know what I'm saying? And when you look at this team, per se, this was a team that was loaded with talent. You had guys like Greg Anthony, who is, who is from Las Vegas, all right? Anderson Hunt from Detroit, Michigan. Okay, Stacey Ogman from Pasadena, California, right? You also had Larry Johnson, who was basically a junior college transfer from Dallas, Texas, right? You had Moses Scurry from Brooklyn, New York. Right, you had basically guys like George, like George Ackles from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I mean, this was a team that was literally, it was loaded beyond belief. And considering the fact when you add a coach like Terry to Jerry Tarkinian, who basically allowed his players to, you know, to be themselves, you know, it was a recipe for success for that particular team. But a little bit more of historical uh, background about this team, right? Basically, Jerry Tarkini was coaching his 17th season with the uh, with the UNLV basketball team, and also rest in peace too. Um, pretty much, Jerry Tarkini was establishing himself as one of the pretty much one of the greatest coaches in college basketball history. But he was one of the most hated people in from in the NCAA, and the reason is is because. Jerry Tarkini was the kind of person that had no problem standing up to the NCAA in terms of his hypocrisy of dishing out, you know, penalties and dishing out, you know, sus suspensions against against larger and most po uh, most powerful universities, right? And pretty much the NCAA tried their hardest to get rid of Jerry Tarkini and basically get rid of that UNLV team for so many years, right? And when he became coach in the early, pretty much starting back in 1973, right? And just when he was just getting things going at UNLV, bam, they tried to suspend him for bogus recruiting violations that he had, you know, when he was coaching at Long Beach State, right? Not mentioning the fact that UCLA had worse violations to what, you know, Jerry Tarkini and his programs were doing, right? Remember, Jerry... Remember, Sam Gilbert was the booster with John Wood, right? And and Sam Sam Gilbert pretty much ran was the man who was running the ship at UCLA. Why do you think they were able to win all those national championships and winning all and get all those top recruits, right? It was all Sam Gilbert, his illegal recruiting tactics, offering them gifts, money, you name it. And the NCAA, what did they do? Absolutely nothing. And I'm glad people like Jerry Tarkini and Bob Knight were able to call out the NCAA in terms of their hypocrisy. And when the NCAA tried to, to suspend Tarkini in 77, he basically sued him and basically was basically issued an injunction to repeal against the against the suspension, right? And 
pretty much he was able to continue as coaching the team, but the program was suffered because of that. And then basically during the eighties, you know, they've had some, you know, they they had really good teams, you know, during that period of time, especially back in eighty seven, when they pretty much when they pretty much the number one team in the nation that year, right? And they were knocking on the doorstep of winning a national championship. And unfortunately they were they basically fell short against the Indy against the Indiana Hoosiers and Bob Knight that went on to win the title in eight in eighty seven. Right. But the thing with Jerry Tarkinian was Tarkinian was that he had no problem, you know, taking chances on players that, you know, were had questionable academic backgrounds. But they basically came in from, you know, impoverished, you know, neighborhoods, you know, and this uh, basically in lower suburban type of, you know, communities. You know what I'm saying? And he didn't have a problem taking chi- taking China chances because remember, he took a chance on Lloyd Daniels, who was pretty much a, a guy who was supremely talented, but had very low academic standards. You know what I'm saying? But unfortunately, it was too much for him because then, because then, on on before he was able to enroll at UNLV in '87, you know what I'm saying? He was basically caught by the cops by an undercover policeman basically buying, you know, crack cocaine. And even though Terry Tarkini had no problem taking the chances of those kind of players, you know, even for him, it was it was a bit too much, right? But um, I just wanted to go out. I, I know I went on a little bit tangent there, but I wanted to illustrate to the point about that. But, you know, with Jerry Tarkini and his, his basically his method of, you know, playing basketball is, was pretty much this. He was a guy that preached full court defense. Right. He was the kind of player. He was kind of I'm sorry. He was the kind of coach that it preached, you know, full court up tempo defense, you know, generating steals to get easy buskets in transition. Right. And he was the innovator of the Omiba defense. Right. Basically a a man zone type of defense that's really hard to coach. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to explain how to coach the Omiba, the Omiba defense because it's a very complicated defense. It was kind of it's kind of like a man type of zone type of defense. And if you don't got strong athletic players to run those particular zones on the Omiba defense, it's, it can be a very deep. It can be a very complex defense to learn. And the positions you got to learn in the defense is very very difficult. But the reason why he took a chance, a lot of those you know players, is because he knew that. Those athletic players would be perfect in his style. And during that 89-90 season, you know, he had the perfect blend of players to pretty much to pretty much, you know, run his system. Right. So pretty much during the entire during that 89-90 season, okay, this was a team that pretty much had high expectations of winning the national championship. But let's keep this in mind. If you watch the uh, old HBO documentary about this about you know, the running Rebels in terms of that team, per se, okay? This was a team that was basically on the relatively gun of the NCAA, where they would suspend any of their players on even on the most egregious things, even if they didn't pay for a long-distance phone call or they didn't return as you know a particular piece of equipment or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, the NCAA was doing whatever they can to try to break that team apart because they knew because they knew how talented they were and they were working whatever they can to make sure that they didn't get to the tournament or even went re- represent college basketball as their team as their national champions but you know Jerry Tarkinian the way he did it was it was very simple we could either you know take it out on everybody or and destroy everybody on the floor or else we could fold but you know credit to the players they sucked it up you know they went through they went through their bogus suspensions through the NCAA and they pretty much steamrolled through everybody. All right. In fact, they finished out the entire year pretty much winning finished out winning the regular season going 26 and 25. All right. Winning their big West, you know, tournament and becoming the top seed in the West re- in the West regional. Right. And then they, they blitzed through little uh, Arkansas, little rock blitz through Ohio state, then survived the scare against ball state and then basically blitzed through Loyola Marymount, who basically were on a Cinderella run after the death of their fallen, you know, star Hank Gathers. All right. Then they survived against Georgia Tech. Okay, with Dennis Scott and uh, and uh, you know Kenny Anderson, they were a really good team. Then, 
you fast forward to the national championship game. Now, this national championship game was against the Duke Blue Devils, right? For basically for Duke, um, since Coach K became coach during that period of time, right? Since they made the national championship game at AB7, all right? They were basically on a tear, winning, basically reaching the final four for the last for the last three straight seasons. And this was their fourth straight time making it to the final four. And it was only their second time under Coach K's, you know, coaching tenure that they made the national championship, right? Now, this was a team that was led by a young uh, point guard in Bobby Hurley, right, who was only a freshman that year, all right? Leitner was basically a sophomore, okay? Thomas Hill was a freshman, right? And also so Brian Davis, who was, who was their future captain two years later, was also a sophomore too. This was basically a young team that pretty much was ent basically was slowly entering their peak. But in the buildup to that game, the media basically hyped it up as good versus evil. And Duke was being perceived as the class, the top establishment of what college basketball is supposed to be. And UNLV was the villains and basically what college basketball was becoming. Right. And, you know, the players were both the both the players were getting kind of tired of that whole, you know, good versus evil, black versus white, you know, thing. But I but I will not lie to you when it, when I say that it really played a huge factor in into the hype of that championship game. But boy, but boy, did that game, I'll tell you what, whatever hype that was built in that game, it went right out the window when when basically when on the opening tip. All right, because basically UNLV ran the floor with with Duke that whole entire game. All right, they basically went up by as many as like seventeen in the first half, and then they just kept blitzing and blitzing, and then you know what I'm saying they kept rubbing up the scoreboard all day long. In fact, when I was we watching the game, it's like we were watch it was like watching a professional basketball team going against a uh, a recreational basketball team that's what it literally was felt like when i was rewatching the game on youtube like UNLV's size their speed and their athleticism was just completely overwhelming duke and you could tell in their faces because they they just couldn't do anything about it no matter what they tried they couldn't do anything about it you know what I mean? They were hitting shots from downtown. They were pounding them on the glass. They were destroying them in the interior. Their full court defense was forcing turnovers galore. And there was nothing Coach K or anyone else could, from Duke that could stop them that night. And then they basically buried them by 30 points, 103 to 73, in one of the biggest lopsided blowout games in championship history. Remember, during the last few championship games, it basically came down to the final possession or the final seconds. But so for this game, it was pretty much a climax to, you know, to wait, basically what UNLV was all about. Basically, a, basically they were just a dominant team at the right time. You know what I'm saying? And they basically celebrated their first ever championship at any level. And it was basically an enjoyable time for basically for the city of Las Vegas but, based, but more importantly for the state of Nevada that pretty much was mostly known for a gambling state but was not known for a lot of their sports. But it was really a enjoyable time, for, you know, for that team. Eventually, you know, the NCAA tried to, you know, you know, hit him with sanctions once again and then basically were able to compromise with the school to hold off on the sanctions till 92. Basically, you know, they allowed the UNLV to defend its championship. And the next year, you know, UNLV went on a tear. You know what I'm saying? They basically went through the entire regular season, you know, pretty much un Okay, excuse me about that. My bad. Now, as I was saying, so during pretty much during that entire uh, season, all right, in '91, they pretty much pretty much UNLV would blitz through everybody. They basically kept most of their starting players from that previous championship uh, season, right? And then pretty much after that, you know, UNLV tore through the entire competition. They pretty much beat down everybody, blew everybody out of the building. All right. They went on a tear of winning 
45 straight games dating back to that previous year when they won the national championship. And they were basically undisputed favorites to repeat as champions. But, you know, sometimes you, sometimes things happen for a reason. Um, Duke came back the next year. They were much more of a better team. They were much more more hungrier, and they did not fear the UNLV like they did the previous year. And they pulled off the upset. Uh, on that night in Indianapolis, they pulled off the upset, and they defeated UNLV en route to their first of two national championships in the early 90s. And even today, Duke is now still the premier college basketball, you know, program in the country. You know what I'm saying? And because of, you know, beating this great UNLV team, you know, of the early 90s. But unfortunately, good things come to an end. You know, the, the injunction on the uh, on the basketball program came in in 92. Even though they had another great year, they weren't able to qualify for the tournament. And basically, Jerry Tarkini was forced to retire after another scandal that hit the that hit the program. So, and my conclusion to this whole thing is, you know, UNLV was a great team for, for that period of time. In fact, they pretty much changed a lot of how basketball, how basketball was played. You know what I mean? They utilized the three-point shot effectively. They used full court press, full court, you know, pressure defense to produce turnovers for easy, you know, buckets in transition. You know what I'm saying? They basically were a tough, gritty, defensive-minded team that will just out basically outman you and, and basically out physical you, you know, at for all 48 minutes. And when you add to the fact that you had lengthy athletes like Larry Johnson, Stacy Ogman, Anderson Hunt, and Grant Anthony as your as your as your starting lineup, it created a lot of matchup problems. And I really and I really felt that Larry Johnson was perhaps the greatest UNLV player of all time, even though he only played two years there. You know what I'm saying? But it was it's unfortunate for me because you know Larry Johnson should have been a Hall of Famer if he didn't have the back injury in '94. You know he sh he was going to have a Hall of Fame type of career, and you know he was able he was able to readjust his game after the back injury. But you know injury slowed him down, and you know age slowed him down there too as well. You know Stacey Mogwin did have a decent career, averaging basically nine, around 15 points per game in his NBA career. You know Greg Anthony had a decent a long decent career in the NBA, and so you know a lot of these guys had had long careers in the NBA after that. You know what I'm saying. But their legacies will forever be remembered as the great team that pretty much did it, you know, in 1990 and pretty much changed the perception of smaller programs in college basketball that can succeed. And so, you know, salute to that great UNLV team and they will be remembered as one of the greatest college basketball teams of all time. So that's pretty much all I have. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And with that, I'm out. Peace.